Matthew 28, beginning at verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Jesus said that he would be raised from the dead. And three days later, he was raised from the dead. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth, I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through Jesus. It seems that the one who predicted his own death and resurrection, the one who said, they will crucify me, but three days later, I will be raised from the dead. If he was actually raised from the dead, then I guess I can believe that he and only he is the way and the truth and the life. Because I don't know if you've been paying attention, but Muhammad never got up. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but Joseph Smith never got out of the grave. But Jesus Christ got up. Jesus Christ prophesied and was raised from the dead. There is no idle word that proceeds from the mouth of God, but what he said he will do. What has God promised you? Do you actually believe it? Do you have the faith to believe that what God promised you that he would actually do? We see Jesus move in mighty ways throughout his story as God on the earth. The first thing that we see Jesus do is turn water into wine. He's at a party with his mom and some friends and the host ran out of wine. And so in a bunch of conversations, they come, they beg Jesus, no, yes, no, yes. Finally, Jesus moves at his mother's word. And he tells the servants to go put water in pots and then go find the most distinguished guest and take the pot that they put water in and pour that into the cup for him to drink. Um, water went in the jug. I don't know if you've ever put water in a jug, but I've never put water in a jug and poured anything other than water out of the jug. But at his word, they did what he commanded them to do. And because they put water in the jug, and because they did what he told them to do, then God moved. When we believe what God says, that is when we move. If you ever want to test your faith, are you doing the thing that actually um, affirms or confirms what you say you believe? But who turned the water into wine? They didn't. Jesus did. When things don't always look the way you planned them, I just want you to know he's working. When things happen around you that frustrate you, when they disappoint you, when you might just be forlorn and fallen and ready to quit. I just want to let you know that he made you a promise in Psalm 30 and verse 11. He said that he would turn around for you your tears into dancing. God made a promise to you that joy would come in the morning. Sorrow might last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Romans 8, 28, he said, and we know, this isn't something that we think, this isn't something that we hope. He said, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. You might have looked at that situation and it seemed impossible. You might have looked at that situation and said, this is not how I planned it. This is not what I wanted to happen. And yet when all is said and done, when God is finished moving, it's better than you could have dreamed. Yeah. 
Why? Because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. There was resurrection power that was working in the life of Jesus. The same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that dwells in us. The same power that lifted him up is the same power that is working today. And if we will believe it, if we'll believe then all things will be possible to us. We also see this moment where um, Peter and Andrew, they were fishermen, they had a fishing business, they had associates out there, they'd been fishing all night long and they came back in and they had caught nothing. Jesus sees them and he says, hey Peter, push your boat back out there and um, go fishing again. Peter said, Lord, we fished all night and we caught absolutely nothing. But at your word, we will do it. Not because he wanted to. Not, not even because he'd been praying about it. Just because the word came and sparked a faith in his heart and he obeyed that word. And what happened? He went out, put more fish than could fit in his boat, had to call his associates over. They put more fish than would fit in their boat. And then the nets began to break. Why? Because when God speaks, God confirms his word with signs following. When God says he's going to do something, God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he would change his mind. Has he not said it, then God will do it. There's not an idle word that proceeds from the mouth of God, but every word of God proves true. Every word. And so I realize maybe you tried, and you've tried, and you have tried, and you have tried. If God promised you, try again. You have prayed, and you have prayed, and you have prayed, and you have prayed. If God promised you, Pray again. Yeah, but I asked her. She said no. I asked her. She said no. I asked her. She said no. Keep asking. You might want to go to a different person. <laughs> Just trying to help the young single folks in our house this morning. Or maybe you've seen she got asked, she got asked, she got asked. Where's my future? Where's, where's what God promised me? He might just be cleaning up that one that's perfect. You know, sometimes it looks like God's taking a little while when it's actually us who are taking a little while to obey him. There, there are those moments when the perfect person just isn't ready yet. So I'm just telling you, if you'll wait on God, not rush things, not go into your own desire, your, your own trying to force it, but you just wait on God. God will move. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So we keep on, we keep believing, we keep standing. We don't quit, but we wait on him. Now there's a, there's a promise in here that sometimes I tend to make very personal. So I would say, I will reap if I do not give up. And absolutely that's true. And that truth is in that text. But there's a broader, greater truth, a deeper truth that we see here. And let us, plural, not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we, plural, will reap if we, plural, do not give up. Let me just talk to the married people in the room for a minute. Um, there is just what is seemingly usually the case that somebody in the marriage is really pursuing God and the other one is sort of slacking. And you, you just think, well, I mean, they do the praying. They do the seeking. They do the following you. Um, okay. And one will put a thousand to flight. But two will put 10,000 to flight. And there is probably a blessing that God has for your house that's a 10X blessing that you haven't seen yet because just one of you is doing the pursuing. But if both of you would pursue God, if both of you would be in agreement and follow God, then I promise you, God will do for you what he's promised to do. But it, it might just take both of you because there is a promise that you are heirs together of the grace of life. 
There is something greater that God has for you that will take both of you serving him to receive. And so we see Jesus multiply this moment on behalf of Peter and his uh, co-workers. We also see more desperate situations happen. Um, I don't know how you feel about it, but, you know, okay, you ran out of wine for the party. People just go home early. Like, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, it doesn't even seem like something that would warrant moving the hand of God, but it is interesting how God seems to be interested in the things that we are interested in. And you know what? So Peter didn't catch anything. Do you know how many people go through their day calling lead, 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 leads and get no response? Happens all the time. And yet they're blessed the third day or the fourth day. So I don't want to diminish what God was doing, but there does seem to be times where the situation is more desperate. And yet we see in those times God move also and maybe even more so because I just want to remind you that uh, and think about this. God did not part shallow water. Jesus did not walk on shallow water. There are those scenarios that are just deeper and they are more desperate. And if we will be faithful to move toward him, God will move toward us and on our behalf. There's a moment where there was a, um, a mom whose daughter was being, the word used is oppressed by the devil. And so for us, we use different words for that today. Um, and so what it looked like was her daughter just had a, um, a debilitating, debilitating thoughts in her mind that she could not overcome. And she was tormented. It was unreasonable. You know, if you are, if you didn't study for a test and you walk into the classroom, it's reasonable that you're worried. That's reasonable. If you're driving your car on E and the light's been on for you don't know how long, it's reasonable for you to maybe worry a little that the car is going to give out of gas. There are reasonable worries. There is reasonable anxiousness. But then there is debilitating worry and concern and shame and condemnation that just plagues us and torments us. And we can't seem to get out of that place of struggle. And this is where her daughter was. And the mom's heart broke on behalf of her daughter. And she went and sought Jesus to move on her behalf and do what was impossible to be done. And what I want you to see about this is that she actually interrupted Jesus in order to receive what it was that she needed. I recognize that God does a whole lot of stuff all by himself. There was nobody sitting at the tomb. There was no prayer meeting going on at the bottom, at the end of the tomb, waiting on the stone to be rolled away. I've heard people suggest that God does nothing unless somebody asks him, but nobody was sitting there asking for the stone to be rolled away, and yet God all by himself moved that stone. When we were dead in our sins, we didn't even know that we needed a Savior. God loved us, and the Word became flesh and fulfilled the law and died for us, was crucified, and then by the Spirit was raised from the dead. I just, I just want you to know God does do stuff by himself. But it is also true that we can interrupt God and by faith move the hand of God on our behalf. Jesus was having dinner with his friends. Jesus was enjoying the conversation. And in a desperate plea for her daughter, that mom just kept begging Jesus. And she wouldn't stop. And the disciples tried to send her away. And nobody wanted her to get to the hand of Jesus. But she just kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on. And then finally, Jesus turns to her. And he says, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Why? Because of her faith. She had faith 
in God, and God moved because of her faith. We see this similar situation where there this time was a dad who had a son who was experiencing the same torment, except this was maybe even deeper because the son would try and harm himself. Let me just say, anytime self-harm is involved, there is spiritual torment. The enemy hates people. The enemy hates the gift of God that is in people. And he will do anything and work any way to torment those people whom God has plans for. And I just want everybody in the room to know that if you love Jesus, that God has plans for you. He said, I have really good plans for you and purpose for you of good success. Not of evil, but of good. And so the enemy wants to hinder the good plans that God has for you. And so this young man was just tormented and he was harming himself and his dad was desperate. He went to the disciples and they couldn't do anything. And then he goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, if you can help me. Jesus said, if I can help you. If you can believe all things are possible. The empty grave convinces me that all things are possible. All things. And then we see this moment where the angel is just sitting on the stone. I love that part. Like, here's this heavy stone placed for the purpose of keeping the Son of God in the grave. <laughs> and then it's rolled away and an angel's just sitting on it. Like, God's plans will not be stopped by the enemy. But whatever he promised he would do, God's absolutely going to do it. And here's the irony in the whole story. Is that, is that the guards that were paid to be there to keep the tomb closed are the only people that saw the stone rolled away. His disciples weren't there. Why weren't they there? Because they were afraid. Why were the rest of them not there? Maybe they didn't believe. In fact, when the women did get there, the first ones to the tomb, bright and early, were the women that morning. Why were they there? Not to see the stone rolled away, not to just look at an empty grave. They were there to anoint the dead body of Jesus. They had no faith. But who was there to see what happened to repeat the story and testify what God did? Two guards that the temple paid to be there who were just there to keep God from moving. And yet, God still moved. Now, here's the thing. This is where we kind of lean into what would be called the minimal facts argument. And just to kind of put this in maybe plain language, um, does anybody like Easter candy? You like Easter candy? Um, it lent for the last 40 days, now it's over, like we can eat whatever we want to this afternoon, drink whatever we want to, like it's going to be a party, right, like this afternoon. We're celebrating the resurrection by eating all the sugar we can possibly find. <laughs> okay, well here's how this works in my house. Um, does anybody like peeps? <laughs> now we've had three services today, and every service people love peeps. I think they're horrible. I think they're the worst wretched candy that has ever been, like it's just some sugar blob with some marshmallow sticky mess inside of it that when your kids get hold of it, it's all over the house for the next three weeks. It's in the car, it's on the carpet. Peeps are the worst thing ever, ever, ever. I digress. Okay, so my wife loves peeps, loves peeps. She buys a basket of candy for each of us. She knows the stuff that we all like, and she gets us, all five of us, an Easter basket. And never once have any of us ever gotten her an Easter basket. But don't worry, because I learned that at home. My dad never got my mom an Easter basket, although she got an Easter basket for every single one of us. So if you ever hear the sins of the father are passed on down to the children, it's not something I can help. Now here I'm in the middle of telling 8 o'clock that story, and he yells. I don't know if you've ever been heckled. Have you ever been heckled by anybody? He heckles me in the middle of the 8 o'clock sermon. He says, I got your mom an Easter basket. I'm like, when did you ever get mom an Easter basket? 
And he says, I've been doing it for two years. <laughs> two years. All right. They have been married for 54 years. But hey, the last two years, mom's had an Easter basket. None of that was of any value to me because I was never there when there was an Easter basket given to mom. So I don't do Easter baskets. I, it's like her birthday happens in March. It was this week. And then we have our anniversary and we have Mother's Day. And, you know, it's just too much to throw Easter in as well. I, I had, like, last week I was talking about how great of a husband I was. I could do all the setting up for, you know, vacation and all. And I just have to tell you I have a boundary. I have a limit. And that's, that's my limit. Three. Three is as good as I get. Um, okay, so she bought herself a basket and filled it with peeps. She does it every year. Don't feel, if you felt bad for her, feel bad for her like 24 years ago. Now, now it's just regular. So... Last year, um, she has all of our baskets, and there's her basket, and it's all nice, and we're all, oh, thanks so much. And then we go on into another room, and then we come back. We're talking about a minimal facts argument. I want you to get lost in the details. We come back, and her basket is empty. Now, all six of us were together. Four kids, me and Ab, we're all together in another room. We go back. No one's been home. No one came in. It was just us. We go back into the kitchen, her basket's empty. And there are a few half-eaten boxes on the ground, and the dog is sitting there. <laughs> no one saw the dog eat anything. Did you see the dog eat the peeps? No. Did any of the six people in the house see the dog eat the peeps? No. The dog can't tell us if she ate the peeps. But if the peeps are gone and the dog is there, by a minimal fact argument, who ate the peeps? The dog. Therefore, if the stone was rolled away and there's no body in the grave, what happened? He got up. That's what happened. The king of kings got up. And it's a story that every single one of the disciples believed. And every single one of the disciples were willing to die for that truth. Why? Because this was the alternative. Tell somebody Jesus was not raised from the dead so you can keep your life here. But Jesus already told us if we'd be willing to give our life here, that we would gain it there. And so their entrance into heaven was not to tell a lie, but rather to hold the truth. And when they told the truth, they died for it. And today, there are 2.7 billion people who all believe the story of the resurrection, who are celebrating Jesus this morning. And on a side note, just in case you're slightly competitive, I tend to be just, just a little bit, I would like you to know that churches like this one that believe like this one, we just happen to be the largest subgroup of those 2.7 billion, 584 million people on the planet worship like we do, believe like we do, believe that God Almighty will not only save you and fill you, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and he will give you the capacity to pray prayers and sing praise that without him, you wouldn't have. So I just wanna remind you the little Presbyterians might have been in church this morning at 6.15, but we're better. <laughs> we're better. We didn't show up till 8. Okay, it's as good as we could do. You didn't show up till 11. <laughs> but we still win. 6.15, 11. We still win. But here's the thing. The angel turns to the women and says, go tell his disciples they will see him later. When Jesus was raised from the dead and returned, the only ones who saw him this time were the disciples. And Jesus gave us another promise. He said, I'm coming again. And the people who will see him come again 
are his disciples. Are you a disciple? Um, this is where the conversation in Christianity can sometimes get a little muddy. Because a disciple of Jesus is one who loves God and loves people. It's one who believes that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and says Jesus is Lord. But I want you to understand that we live by a new covenant that is better than the old covenant. An entrance into the new covenant is not that you were born into the right family or you grew up in the right nation or you grew up in the right neighborhood, but your entrance into the new covenant is that you believe the story and you confess Jesus is Lord. That confession is not just a one-time statement that you make. It is a lifestyle. Jesus is Lord. And in our 2024 church conversation, if we just kind of say we're supposed to love God and we're supposed to love people and we're saved by grace through faith, what we've decided to do with those four things, grace and faith and God and people, is that we have decided to emphasize God's grace and we've decided to emphasize loving people. The problem is we are neglecting to speak of our faith that without works is dead, and we are neglecting to tell the story of loving God. Now, for some of you that might be um, visual learners, let's, let's take it like this. My Bible has 1,042 pages. If we say that the gospel is about God creating everything and then the fall and then him redeeming us back to himself, if that's the story of the gospel, and that's all of it, I just want you to know that out of these 1,042 pages, that that is about 104 of them, that whole story. Um, that means that it's this much of the Bible. You know what this is? <laughs> this is all about keeping what this gave you. And the reason why there's so much more of this than there is this is because this is everything that God did for you that you could freely have, and this is everything that we do to keep what he gives us. And when we understand that, then we realize that all of those pages are not in vain. But I don't want our faith to be in vain either. There is the potential of having vanity in our Christian lifestyle. It's actually possible. We see this conversation in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Now, brothers, I remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. When you believe and you confess by faith, you receive the grace of God. He says, if you don't hold fast to it, then your belief was in vain. And you look like the person that Jesus told the story about who received the word with gladness and they walked in it for a minute. But when persecution came, when life got a little bit hard, what they were given, they let go of. And he said they fell away. And we can have a Christianity that ends up being lived in vain if we don't hold fast to it. That's our part of the covenant. We see God's part of the covenant later. Stay in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And Paul said, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So if God didn't do what God said he was going to do, our faith is in vain. If we don't do what we promise we are going to do, our faith is in vain. That is what is called a covenant, that God does what God said he would do, and we do what we promised we would do. We keep what God gave us. You couldn't do anything to deserve God loving you and Jesus dying for you. That is all grace. That is all God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing we could do to deserve or earn, ever. But once we receive that, now he calls us into a lifestyle of keeping what he gave us. He said it this way in, in um, Matthew chapter 14 and verse 15. 
Uh, John 14, 15. He said, it, he said it like this. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we love God, what do we do? We keep commandments. Like when we say, do you love people? We know what that looks like. Are we kind to people? Do we speak good words to people? Do we share when we can share? Do we help where we can help? Like it, we get it. We love people. But he said, you have to love God too. How do we love God? We love God by keeping his commandments. We see this in Jude chapter 1 and verse 20. But you, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith and praying in the Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. There is a lifestyle that is to be lived. We have a tendency today to just sort of drift away from the commandments, to just do our own thing. We've gotten a little bit impatient with God. If we don't see him move in the way that we want him to move, then we're just gonna go step out and we're gonna do it our way. The problem is doing things our way will never lead to life. But eventually, if we keep doing things our way, we will keep resisting him, rejecting him, until we come to a place where we don't believe anything anymore and now we've just been heaped upon us with a misery that comes from the enemy. If I could quote Axl Rose on Easter... He said, I used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do it, so the little got more and more, right? Like, I, it, it was, I, just, I just stepped out for a minute. I just, I just did a little, but it's never enough. And we keep heaping to ourselves until we put our lives on a pathway to destruction. But God said, if you'll keep my commandments, if you will love me, you will keep yourself in my love. You will build yourself up and then you will find yourself in a place that leads to eternal life. But we have to keep those. Keep those commandments. Um, we, see this, we see this also by the Apostle Paul. He said to us in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Have you ever had people come over to your house, you were having a party or something, and somebody got there early? There's always somebody that shows up early. You're not quite ready you're out there with a the pressure washer and you're like trying and then they pull up. Hey, I hope you don't mind. We're early. <laughs> no one loved their appearing. <laughs> no one. Why didn't they love their appearing? Because they were early. But here's the thing that Jesus told us. You always be ready because nobody knows the day or the hour. And so there is the command to us that we are to live ready. If I know Jesus is coming back, then my lifestyle is going to be lived as if he's actually coming back. Because the one who said that I will be raised from the dead is the same one that said, behold, I am coming soon and I'm bringing my reward with me. And so every single child of God who knows that the king of kings made a promise, then that means every single one of us are believing him to make good on that promise and to return. So if I believe he's coming back, how am I living? I'm living like he's coming. I'm not only loving people, I'm loving God. I'm not only going to my neighbor's house and doing something nice, I'm, I'm actually coming to God's house. I'll be in his space. And I'm raising my kids like there's a promise that when they grow old, they will not, they will not, they will not drift. Let me just say, it might be fun watching a home run. It might be great when you get somebody in your house that brings home an A, but there's nothing greater. There's nothing that gives a parent more peace, more joy than to see their children with their hands uplifted in the house of God. 
God, giving glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let me just tell you, that doesn't just happen. They don't just do that. It is a continual, consistent bringing them into the house of God, seeing you with your hands lifted up, but also seeing a lifestyle that you live on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, and they understand, oh, there's something to this. Like, I recognize what's going on here. People who love Jesus live in the fullness of his promise. The king is coming. The king has made us a promise. His return is near. Are we ready? Ready?